Hey everyone, so this is the first video I'll have on ASA just because I didn't want to use OBS while playing ASA initially because I didn't want my computer to explode, but here we are. This is a solo offline save file, it's, and because I've pretty much done everything on offline, I decided to make my own content. And what I mean by that is, the title of this video is probably going to be like, what if Ark was like Pokemon? And the reasoning behind this is because I'm going to go for every single tame you can on the island. I'll see if I follow through on this or not. I, I, I might get lazy or unmotivated and then uh, I, I might drop this. But the idea is every time I tame something, I'm going to cross it off the list. And then every time it gets tamed, it's going to be like a Pokedex effect. I was talking about this with a friend last night. Every time I successfully tame something, I'll, I'll throw the dossier up and have it like read you the, the information on the dossier. So it's like the Pokedex, like the you'll you'll understand when when I start taming shit. But okay, so step one is grab the Pokeballs. Oh yeah, first we got a Dino White. Okay, so we do that, so then everything's fresh. And I forgot to mention in the beginning that I do have a mod on to add extra creatures. The mod I have on is. Uh, Dino Discovery, I think. And then I added the Phoenix mod. Okay, so after Dino Wiping, we have a little, like, time has passed by, so now we have some stuff spawning already. Mainly, like, the Parasaur. Uh, what level are you? 130? Okay. Alright, we're gonna have to... They like, uh, all this shit. I don't remember what the rates are on this, so... I might cut to, like, when they're tamed. Dilophosaurus Sputatrix is a strange creature. It stands at just over half the size of known Dilophosaurs and runs from aggressors as often as it fights them. Dilophosaurus sputatrix has a few traits not common in the Dilophosaurus genus. It has a very shrill call and a decorative ridge of skin on its neck. I believe these are used to attract mates, as well as intimidate prey and would-be predators. Instead of attacking its prey outright, Dilophosaurus sputatrix spits venom to weaken and paralyze it before moving in for the kill. Because of their shrill cry and their ability to attack intruders from range, Dilophosaurus seems most suited as guard dogs. Due to their small size, they are not suitable as mounts. I don't know, I don't remember what settings I have on. Parasaurolophus amphibio has one of the more interesting adaptations of any creature I've seen on the island. Like all Parasaur, it has a signature crest on its head. Very docile at first, I've been able to approach the creature without disturbing it. If startled, however, the creature can vocalize a distress call to the surrounding area that warns of danger. Parasaurolophus appears to be low on the food chain and is hunted by everything, creatures and humans alike, which explains its skittish nature. It is a good source of meat and hide if you can manage to keep up with it long enough to kill it. Despite being what most tribes consider a relatively useless creature to tame, I once met an interesting woman who had tamed an entire herd of them. She informed me that many overlooked the creature's potential. She even graciously gifted me a fancy saddle to put on my own Parasaurolophus one day. As a relatively simple creature to domesticate, Parasaurolophus is commonly one of the first mounts a tribe will be able to acquire. Its ability to run relatively fast for lengthy intervals makes it a solid mode of medium range transportation, though it has almost no ability to defend itself or its rider in a traditional sense. Smaller creatures, however, appear to be frightened by the horn of Parasaurolophus, although it doesn't do much damage. It also has decent weight bearing capabilities, which could prove useful for nomadic tribes as they work to establish a presence on the island. I don't remember these either. I think these are uh, berries.
Rathus Replica, more commonly known as the Dodo Bird, is quite possibly the dumbest creature I've ever seen in my life. It wanders around the beaches of the island, pecking berries off bushes, and being eaten by all manner of carnivore. Without the dodo, the whole island's food chain would disintegrate. This subspecies of the dodo has developed an unbelievably clever way to sustain itself. They mate constantly. I'm fairly convinced that they reach full maturity within a week of being born. This is the only trait keeping them populous on the island. While it can be done, there is almost no reason to domesticate a raphus replicare. It cannot carry enough to be a beast of burden, it does not provide much food, and it's too stupid to show companionship. It could work as a last-ditch food source, though, so I suppose keeping some around for lean times has a certain logic. Well, I'll have to make a note of, like, stuff I've tamed. Oh, nice, I tamed it. Among the most vocal creatures on the island, Ichthyornis piscocus actually appears to be a relatively normal seagull. It primarily eats fish, and its distinctive cries can be heard echoing over across the island's many beaches. As you might expect from a seagull, Ichthyornis will flee at the slightest provocation. Ichthyornis is a versatile and opportunistic hunter. Its primary form of attack is to dive into the top layers of water and impale its prey. However, since its food source can be unpredictable, Ichthyornis has developed a keen ability to steal food from unsuspecting travelers. Their affinity for shiny objects leads them to sometimes knock tools and weapons out of the hands of unsuspecting survivors. But Ichthyornis is too small to actually fly off with them. Ichthyornis surprised me by being a very loyal and very social creature once tamed. It likes to ride on its owner's shoulder and bring that person treats, in the form of fish, of course which its beak grip enhances with extra healing vitamins. The personality of Ichthyornis reminds me of a house cat hauling a trophy prey back home, except it brings extra healthy fish instead. Carbonomys obibulus is one of the least aggressive creatures on the island. Were it not for the plethora of predators on the island, I'm quite certain that it would spend its days basking in the sun, eating or sleeping. Carbonomys leads a simple, solitary life. Nevertheless, it seems to be one of the most peaceful animals I have yet encountered. With its slow walking speed, the only things that keep it safe are its surprisingly fast swim speed and its incredibly thick shell, which can absorb tremendous damage. Carbonomys' swift swim rate, fairly high strength, superior shell defenses, and lack of real threat makes it an ideal armored mount for many survivors who shy away from violence. It can carry its rider to the ocean's resources at fairly high speed, and is not particularly dangerous to tame. Pteranodon wyvernus is a large pterosaur, capable of flying more quickly than any creature I have witnessed on this island thus far. It seems to have relatively poor stamina in comparison to its quick speed, however, making frequent pit stops on the beaches before taking off again. While other humans I've seen on the island still insist on calling it a pterodactyl, this is inaccurate. Pteranodon wyvernus's poor fighting and defensive skills mean they are likely to scavenge any number of dead animals rather than engage in dangerous combat with other creatures. They also flee at the slightest sign of trouble. Because of this, they are one of the most common creatures to be found darting across the island skies. Pteranodons seem to be among most popular flying companions from what I have witnessed, possibly because they are relatively easy to tame with a slingshot or bow. Mounting a Pteranodon must be among the fastest and safest ways to get around the island, but it doesn't provide any measure of secrecy in comparison to travel on land through the dense foliage. Lystrosaurus amacifidelis is a small herbivore, common to much of the island. Only about two feet long, it is not high on the food chain, and eats small plant life. The island's poisonous insects seem to have little effect on the Lystrosaurus. Despite being among the island's tinier herbivores, Lystrosaurus is an incredibly resilient survivor. It recovers most of its torpor and health much faster than most creatures, which makes rendering a Lystrosaurus unconscious a rather difficult affair. Not surprisingly, Lystrosaurus is an extremely loyal pet once tamed. It's a very fast learner, so it gains experience much more quickly than most other creatures. Additionally, its presence nearby appears to inspire allies, making them learn more rapidly as well. Thus, 
Lystrosaurus is an excellent addition to any tribe's hunting party. Were it not restricted to the waters, Carcharodon ultramegalodon would be one of the most dangerous creatures on the island. As powerful and dangerous as the Tyrannosaurus is on land, Megalodon is near its equal in the water. In addition, it has a speed advantage over any non-aquatic creature when submerged. Megalodons need large quantities of food to sustain themselves, so they attack most creatures immediately on sight. Smaller fish are the sole exception I've seen. I believe this is because they cost more energy for Megalodons to catch than the predator would gain. Having access to the resources and treasures hidden deep within the ocean is near impossible without a domesticated sea creature. The Megalodon, though difficult to domesticate, proves to be very useful when exploring the deep sea. It's not the most efficient swimmer, but it should be able to protect your cargo should you find yourself in a hostile encounter. Okay, and we landed. So this is the other base. It's uh, pretty far from the first base. It's, it's directly east and west, pretty much. Uh, we're gonna drop down here, I think. It doesn't have that much topor, to be honest. Um, we can probably do this. Uh, let's set you to passive. Oh my lord. What poison, man? Oh, the Mega Neuron? Yeah, so like... The other thing is like, I also don't care about levels in this. I just need to see them. It's kind of like Pokemon, you, like, as long as you catch them, they will have the credit. But if I want to later, I'll like, go by and... Oh, is that a Sarko down there? I, if I want to later, I will um, catch a higher level one. Is this a passive? Okay. Well, I, I probably should have asked that prior to shooting it with a uh, drink, but you know. Pheomia ignavis is another one of the island's generally docile herd animals. They are small enough that almost any predator can bring them down, but large enough to provide plenty of meat. Were it not for the protection of the herd and their instinct to run from any predator, these would almost certainly be hunted to extinction. Pheomia's tusks and trunk make it especially suited to scavenging plant life from the ground. It uses its tusks to dig up loose plant life then uses its stubby trunk to scoop the foliage into its mouth. Adult Pheomia often dig up food for their young, and watching a baby Pheomia attempt to use its trunk can be quite amusing. While it is completely possible to ride a Pheomia around, they are a meager choice. They work very well, however, as pack mules. If you feed the Pheomia a stimberry, it serves as a laxative in the creature's digestive system. Knowing this, Tribal communities often keep a herd of these as livestock to produce mass quantities of fertilizer. If fertilized versus non-fertilized matter. I don't really often to use fertilizing, so I can help it. A smaller relative of Sarcosuchus, Caprosuchus paludentium, is a water-based carnivore primarily found lurking among the island swamps. A naturally fast runner that is even faster in the water it is a solitary hunter that picks off small to medium creatures, especially those isolated from their pack. When attacking, Caprosuchus uses two main tactics. First, it patiently waits below the water surface and when the target is sufficiently close by, will perform a lateral jump that it uses to quickly close distance with its prey and drag it underwater. Secondly, it attacks the prey's vital areas specifically to drain its stamina. These two techniques effectively prevent most creatures from escaping Caprosuchus once an assault has begun. Survivors are generally split about the usefulness of Caprosuchus. Some love its speed both in and out of the water, essentially making it among the fastest small-sized all-terrain mounts when traveling through the wetlands. Others do not like how relatively frail Caprosuchus is and do not think its high speed and ensnaring attacks make up for this shortcoming.
Oh, what the fuck? I was waiting for this thing to tame up and the fucking camera attacked. Assaulted me. <laughs> Among the island's swamp-based threats, Sakasukus excubita is a lot like what you might expect from a giant crocodile. A patient killing machine. It spends most of its days lazily waiting in the water for prey to walk near. That said, it is not opposed to scurrying onto land and pressing the issue when hungry. A good tactic for escaping many predators is to jump into the water, as most are slow swimmers. This is a bad tactic for escaping a sarcosuchus, obviously, as they are actually faster in the water than they are on land. Whether in land or water, it utilizes a well-rounded arsenal of attacks to display its prowess as a hunter. If it desires to grab a predator and spin into a death roll, quickly lunge forward for a surprise attack and target a foe directly behind it. It's able to do so with extreme ease. Sarcosuchus is a ferocious creature that even causes the fearless piranha to flee at the sight of it. Despite being river-dwelling creatures, Sarcosuchus seem quite at ease in the oceans. More than a few fishing communities use them as mounts, simply to help fight off megalodons, or to gain better access to resources found within the reefs. Hey, uh, that's gonna probably do it for episode one of, I, I don't know, I guess I'll call it Arcos Pokemon episode one or something. I'll probably record more of this, I don't know, tomorrow or, you know, whenever I feel like it. <laughs> I know that's not the greatest answer, but that's the answer I have. But yeah, uh, anyway, if you like it, go ahead and subscribe, uh, like, comment, do whatever, and I'll see you next time.